Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly live program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who in their desire to follow Jesus Christ were brought on the full journey home to the church. And my guest tonight, in some sense, doesn't fit the mold of my usual guest. Dr. Benjamin Weicker, who is presently a uh, assistant, associate professor? Assistant. assistant. Assistant professor at Franciscan University in Latin and the classics, mm -hmm. and yet intends to be, you will by next year be... Teaching philosophy of science. Teaching philosophy of science, which, wow. I mean, there's a, a subject you and I really share, and I'd love, us, love for us to talk about that tonight, but we'll only get, with one hour, what can you do? But uh, we'll talk about his journey. Now, the theme we've chosen for tonight, maybe on the surface sounds a bit esoteric, <laughs> And that is the rediscover, rediscovering goodness. But Ben talks about in his own uh, educational experience, his journey, he discovered the uh, disruption that had happened in history in our understanding of nature and in the process our own understanding of humanity, which led to a disruption of faith and even as we experience today, a great disruption of culture. And we'll talk about how that affects our lives very practically. But in the process, it brought him to faith in Jesus Christ and into the church. Now, you're an important part of this program. So even now, if you have any questions, start calling at 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Ben, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. It's hard to stay away from that subject of science and religion. It's sad that so many seem to ignore it, but isn't it so important today? Yeah. I think, I, in fact, at this time, since it tends to define culture, and people bow to it as if it were uh, issuing edicts from on high, we need to be ever more careful about how we judge science. Hmm. Not reject it, but not accept it too easily, but really understand it right. very thoroughly. It's relationship to faith. I mean, there's a yeah. sense in which in our culture, the cardinals and bishops, and even at time the pope, are men and women of science yeah. who have gained influence through their writings or through their teaching and sometimes teaching very strange doctrines that get press mm -hmm. and get pushed and then influence our lives and uh, have shaped our families, have shaped our understanding of, of, of good and evil, mm -hmm. whether there is such a thing. I mean, that's what's happened and we've reached that in our modern culture. But setting that aside, and maybe we'll come back to it later, right. let's begin, as we usually do every week, <clears throat> share with the audience your early spiritual journey. Hmm. Well, I had probably about the, the kind of uh, a mainstream Protestant upbringing that, that most people have in America. Right? That's why it's called the mainstream, right? <laughs> so it wasn't anything, uh, uh, as with most converts, it wasn't as if I was a... Uh, um, what red hot fervent yeah. even a Bible thumping Jesus I, 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 I'm free I probably would have been a better person had I been but but I wasn't I wasn't uh, for better or worse uh, it's not that I had a bad upbringing my upbringing was fine my parents are wonderful uh, but uh, the the you know we 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 weren't really churched in a sense we went to the Methodist Church um, and I was baptized in a Church of Christ uh, and then we we went to Methodist churches and it was Fine. And as a child, I remember sitting there and enduring an hour of it and thinking, why am I here? I don't know. But that's what all kids are thinking. Uh, so it wasn't really any dramatic change occurring in my life uh, until I went to college. Mm -hmm. You know, un until then, I, I, uh, I sort of dabbled maybe in Christianity, trying to get serious at particular times. Yeah. Uh, picking up the Bible and reading it and think, okay, this is, this is serious stuff. I, this is time to take this seriously, right? And you rick it up and find out, uh, all due honor aside, th that uh, it's, it's a kind of a confusing instruction manual. Yeah. If you just pick it up, right? If you just pick it up and, and read it, okay, well, now what do I do? Yeah. You know? In fact, there's, there's, there's great jokes on that. I won't go to one, but depending on where you open it up, you, yeah. know, you can find yeah. some really strange instructions. You could. Some weird, middle of Habakkuk or yeah, something I, like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and, and in fact, that, that really played into my conversion much later when I realized the danger of simply trying to invent Christianity from the Bible. Hmm. You know, uh, the dangers involved are simply repeating all the errors that have already been made. Yeah. 
And, uh, but it wasn't until later until I really understood that. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, growing up, uh, I, I would uh, uh, maybe several times try to take Christianity seriously and end up frustrated, you know, end up not having done what I should have done, but having no idea what it would look like to do it right. <laughs> so nothing really happened until uh, college, uh, until I went to college. Um, at that point, it wasn't Christianity, oddly enough. And I think this is good because it created a kind of a, a clearing of the ground, hmm. fertilizing of the soil, making it rich, making it something you could put the seeds of the gospel in again. Hmm. Uh, but it was the rediscovery of uh, the great books, the great arguments. And I was trying to think of a way to characterize this. And the only thing I think of, and it's probably because I watched this movie 147 times, was The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Because I, feel, I felt like when I went to college, I was out of Kansas, and things weren't black and white anymore. Mm. And I remember just sitting in front of those books, just with butterflies in my stomach. You know, Homer's Iliad, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Define the great books, just in case some of the audience don't understand oh, what's well, what meant by that term. The great books uh, are simply, the, as you would think, the, the, the best things that have been written. By human beings, the best that one of my professors said, uh, the best that has been thought and said. Hmm. Now, the, the trick is that when you study the great books, you also study the, the most profoundly bad things. Yes. And, and, and interestingly enough, uh, in great part, it was studying the great errors hmm. that converted me in, in sort of reverse or by negative image. Hmm. Uh, so college was really the beginning of that. And, and uh, I, I, one professor in particular, um, Ernest Walters, in, in political philosophy, that was my undergraduate, political philosophy, uh, his lectures, I, f I felt as if I would had just been opened up to it, an enormous, beautiful landscape coming out of Kansas, you know, everything's flat and gray, you know, the weeds <laughs> everywhere, and, and this lush fauna and flora and streams and crashing, you know, big animals and... Um, you know, seeing this and, and uh, hearing these great arguments was, for me, like that. Discovering a land, an intellectual land, that I'd never imagined existed. Hmm. And it just, I, I was, I don't know, religiously obsessed by it. Can I say that? <laughs> but, but, but it was, uh, uh, you know, the arguments of uh, all the great philosophers and theologians, uh, and I guess uh, anti-theologians, I don't know what you would sure. call them, you know, uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle, um, St. Thomas. Right. Now at the time, St. Thomas was just one of the guys. He wasn't a Catholic for yeah. me. Uh, my undergraduate was a, um, a, a, it was affiliated with a Protestant school, but it had since sort of shed that. Mm. But it was a good liberal arts school. Mm. Uh, but when, when I read St. Thomas, I, I was profoundly influenced by him, but I didn't, not as a Catholic. Just as a philosopher. Just as a, well, just as a theologian, you know, he's just, here's a great person. Here's one more great person. So I would read Plato, I read St. Thomas, and, uh, and then on the negative side, uh, uh, this professor took me through uh, uh, the, the early uh, modern thinkers who most profoundly define the way we live today. Now, I didn't know that at a time, but the way that this uh, uh, wonderful man lectured I just begin to see all these connections. Yeah. That's why we do that. That's why we think that. That's mm -hmm. why this. That's why that. So I'm reading Machiavelli and Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and Rousseau and Marx and Nietzsche and the whole lineup and saying, oh my word, mm -hmm. uh, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't defined in anything in relationship to the Catholic Church. Just or faith at all. Or fa in, in a sense, you know, I, I knew Christianity was there, sort of like St. Augustine, you know, Christianity was always there, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, you know, at stake for me was truth. Yeah. And in a way, it wasn't, I, I thought Christianity was true, I just didn't know what it, what it was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a strange thing. Uh, so I, hadn't, it, I wasn't really studying Christian doctrines. But what I was doing, and I didn't know it at the time, we never do, is rediscovering natural truth rediscovering natural goodness, mm -hmm. rediscovering natural beauty, mm -hmm. and realizing this, the profound elevation of the human soul 
that occurs when you read these arguments. Mm. You know, when you read Plato's Republic, it just transformed me. Mm. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, everything about it w was great. Mm. <laughs> and when you're introduced to greatness, you're, you're not satisfied with anything less. Mm. And it's interesting that in your reading then of the other side, that, that conscience within, that voice within, was rec helping you recognize For, the negativity of yeah, what they were saying. Well, Contrariness to the other yeah. thread of goodness. Well, that's the saying. natural law. Yeah. You know, when somebody says, as Machiavelli did, well, there is no good and evil, friends. There, uh, nature is not good. Nature is ordered by chance. We are the folks who need to create truth hmm. because nature doesn't give it to you. That's, ha that's uh, Machiavelli's argument, and in Hobbes picks it up in the 1500s. Okay. So Machiavelli, it was one of the earliest modern rejections of the goodness of nature. And it really is this simple. Uh, to the, the, the dividing line is right at how we understand nature. Is it caused by an intelligent source? Is it caused by God? Is it designed? Is it created? Or is it an, a mere artifact of chance? Hmm. Well, the essentially modern thing to do, in mean, reading Machiavelli and Hobbes and so on, was to say chance. Hmm. And if it's chance, then the only intelligent source of order is human nature. Hmm. Now, anyone that reads casually, the Genesis account <laughs> of the origin of good and evil is going to recognize that. Yeah. When you begin to say that we have to define goodness because nature is accidentally ordered. Uh, from a Machiavellian. From, Machi from Machiavelli and from Hobbes. Yeah. Uh, that really is, is the, the beginning of, for me, it was for the beginning, the, the discovery of what it really meant to be evil. And oddly enough, I think that the, the path to hell was from good intentions. I think they really thought yeah. that God didn't exist. Hmm. Right? That doesn't excuse them. Yeah. And <coughs> it's interesting to say, just in that simple description of what you said about, mm -hmm. about chance being the... Uh, the new God. The new God. <laughs> and then it's our responsibility to put order in what's here. Yeah. You see that then played out in the philosophies of Darwin. You see it played yeah, out absolutely. even in what happened in Nazi Germany and the yeah. responsibility of feeling that it's our responsibility to uh, perfect humanity by choosing that which should live and that which should die. Yeah. You know, that was the, that, and that threads all around us affecting it's the, our politics today. Yeah, oh absolutely. I mean, the, the thing we're facing right now was begun 500 years ago. Okay. It's just that now Machiavelli's arguments aren't theoretical, hmm. they're real. Uh, when you can hold that DNA in your hands and you can try to put a human being in a petri dish hmm. and you argue that there is no good and evil but that which we make and we're in the driver's seat. And, and subtly at that, underneath that is if one believes that all of this is chance, mm -hmm. then ultimately one has to recognize, if you believe that, yeah. that the value of the human person is no different than the value of this table here. Because ultimately we have no inerrant goodness, inerrant value, because we're just mere accidents. Yes, that, that's absolutely true, and you see it in, in the, I uh, was just reading a, this horrible person, pray for him, uh, <laughs> but, but he argues rightly, I think rightly, on, uh, uh, that if you take the evolutionary uh, arguments seriously, I would call them more properly materialistic arguments, yeah. and we really are just yeah. an accidental thing that has arisen, um, there isn't really a species distinction. You can't make one. And so his argument was, well, if you look, if you measure uh, the various indices of, of what it means to be uh, a person, you'll find out that a lot of the apes are a little higher than the scale than a lot of the humans. <laughs> and, and he was arguing this for the sake of infanticide because infants don't make the grade yet. And if they really are just a bag of atoms, yeah. why not? Yeah. No. So, so you see, you come full circle In to the ancient pagan An army. idea, a mere philosophical idea. It's not an idea anymore. Shapes a world. Yeah. Right? That's right. At that time, in your journey 
uh, you had brought up and brought up basically nominally in your Methodist. I was days. an occasional Methodist. So uh, the Catholic Church and even a more intimate walk with Christ was really not a part of your agenda, I presume. It certainly wasn't on the front burner. I mean, I, uh, well, you know, it depends on how you understand it. Um, I was wildly excited about truth. Mm. And you can't just be excited about truth and not end up there. Mm. Uh, so it's always, it was always implicit. It just, it, you know, I was too, f no. <laughs> <laughs> too human. <laughs> I didn't know. Well, in the midst of that, then, what was the aha experience or event that got you interested in coming to the Catholic Church? Well, it was a long aha, a long drawn-out aha. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a, a poof, a dramatic experience. What occurred was, uh, and, uh, I, I went to undergraduate school, got my degree in political philosophy, and wanted to continue to think for a living, which means to get a PhD. Right, <laughs> and and hope someone will pay you. Uh, this so makes you think. People think. You th yeah, 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 that's right. I, I, I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I open up my own thinkery like Socrates. Um, so so I went to I went to graduate school uh, to get a degree in in theology, because Which I, I think is interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, you're sounding like my fraternity brothers. My fraternity brothers said you were doing what? <laughs> so, uh, you know. I mean, the idea of going into theology when you don't have a real commitment to Christ. Yeah, I, I, I'd equipped him into truth, and I knew that theology talked about truth, and I was not an, un, it's not that like I was an unbeliever, yeah. but uh, it just wasn't a, it wasn't the core. I didn't work mm -hmm. from Christ out, I, I, I worked from out in, right. so to speak. <laughs> so I go to graduate school, and I think I'm just going to get more of that wonderful undergraduate education, and what happened was just the reverse. Mm -hmm. I had a horrible time. It was it was a it was a prolonged four-year Maalox moment. You know, I just it, 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 you just think, why is this happening to me? What have I done? Um, because what occurred where I went to graduate school is it was a it was a, a um, how would you describe it? A, a it had been long since cut from its original Protestant moorings, which just happened to be Methodist, and had become. Um, a cutting edge. It was, a, it was. It's a top ten school in religion. It become a cutting edge, which is, which is the cut actually had to do with cutting itself from Christianity. Yeah, they didn't know that. Yeah. But the, the 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 thing that it did was make violently clear that something was wrong here. Hmm. So, but I'm seeing the end result of the problem. Hmm. Okay. So, I don't. I'm still not thinking anything about Catholicism. In fact, I don't think I ever really talked to an actual Catholic, or at least I didn't know I did. Mm. I think there was one in my fraternity or something. I don't know, but uh, I didn't. You know, I don't think I really met and talked to an actual breathing Catholic prior to that. Uh, <laughs> so they were all strange birds for me. Uh, but there happened to be one there. Um, but in any case, the the, the place where I went, um, it had. It's, it was championing <laughs> the release from Christianity. It, yeah. it, 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 it exalted in calling itself post-Christian. Yeah. And post-Christian uh, values and post-Christian Yeah, oh my heavens, you know, they, they were, they were yeah. championing all kinds of things from uh, uh, abortion to uh, homosexuality, I'm saying, and, and at the same time, undermining all the central, do all the doctrines. Now, I didn't know they were all the doctrines at the time. But I knew something was wrong. Okay, so I'm looking at this and thinking, I have not. I've come to a very strange land here, <laughs> from you know, from Kansas to Oz, and now I don't know where I am. Uh, and I, and uh, I, I, it, it pushed me to say, well, what? Why are you thinking these things? Because a lot of what they thought was rooted in the errors that I'd already. Mm -hmm. Gone through as an undergraduate, and but they didn't they didn't know that. Now I remember sitting in a scripture class. And I'm, I'm going to clarify again. This is a, and I'm not saying this to <coughs> nail a Protestant theological school, but it happened to be a Protestant. Originally a Protestant. School. Originally, originally, but yeah. it had lost its morning <coughs> long point. ago. Okay, okay. So um, I remember hearing them discuss. 
how you should interpret scripture and what you could get out of it and so on. And I just, wait a second, this is, this is Thomas Hobbes. This is Benedict Spinoza. What are you doing following these worn out, uh, ill-contrived theories? But they didn't know it. You know, because they had not had this background. Yeah. And it was, it was just irritating to me because, well, haven't you read these? Haven't you read that? And I hadn't read, read these things. Yeah. And I said, do you, you know, do you know that this mode of scriptural analysis was invented by Thomas Hobbes to destroy Christianity? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a problem to you? Well, they didn't have any idea what I was talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, because, again, they'd not read these things. They just picked up from the 19th century and started their scriptural scholarship from there. Well, it was already gone by then. <laughs> it had already been, been co-opted by the modern project. Uh, so coming from that end, uh, I'm walking backwards and saying, you know, in time walking backwards saying, okay, you're here now, how did you get there? So I'm, I'm going back historically saying, okay, I see where you got that idea, I see where you got that idea, and meanwhile seeing them all rooted in this, hmm. uh, in this original disruption in the 1500s. Yeah. Um, at the other end of it, I began to read uh, church history. I took a church history course. I thought, well, it behooves me to know something about the church. Right? And I wasn't even going to church then, by the way. So I'm really a sad sack. I'm a theology major, and, I, and, I, and as I'm yet, I've yeah, gone to church. Yeah, it, it didn't occur to me. That yeah, was one of the things, yeah, that, that I needed to do. Surely it doesn't happen <coughs> to other people. I mean, there's no other theologians that are like that. I did, not that I'm aware of. Not, not that no, I'm aware of. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. So I'm, I'm reading the, uh, uh, I'm I took a uh, course in early, uh, well, actually, it was up through the Middle Ages. And one of the things we read was J. N. D. Kelly's uh, uh, Early Christian Doctrines. And I had, an, I would say, called a Newman experience then. Yeah. I'm reading this, and I realize, wait a second, these doctrines didn't just fall from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, it took, it was a battle, a five-century battle, trying to define these doctrines. Um, with, and keep from distorting the original revelation. That's one thing I saw carefully is they had the original, just having the original revelation somehow was not enough because you saw people using religious texts, the Old Testament, and whatever New Testament documents they had then, and coming up with wild ideas about the nature of Christ and all the fights for the first five centuries were about defining the Trinity in some way. Well, one thing that I realized right then and there is that, uh, well, several things. One of them is without ecclesiastical authority, none of the creeds would be, period. None of the creeds would be. And I realized that all of the Protestants had the creeds or some mode of them. That worried me, right? So you're saying, <laughs> okay, now look, we're talking bishops and councils here, campers. Right? <laughs> Bishops and councils and arguments um, on the highest level uh, where, where it's impossible to imagine these creeds ever coming into existence without that authority. It's not authority like, you believe this because we said so. It's, this was the revelation we received. Yeah. You can't say that... that uh, uh, that Christ was not a, a man. You can't say that Christ was not God. You can't say that Christ had three natures or four natures or whatever you're going to do to him. You can't say they didn't have a real soul. I mean, you can't do those things. Why? Because what we received, that distorts. Right? So it worked from what we received originally and protected that. And all the creeds came into being to protect that. Well. I mean, for heaven's sakes, you know, that put together for me the political philosophy I learned as an undergraduate. And what, is, what proved to be necessary historically, it's just what is true, what happened to bring these creeds into being. You had to have ecclesiastical authority. It had to be real serious. Um, it wasn't sola scriptura. In fact, when I remember when, when I was reading something, reading a really very bad book in the New Testament, which I was assigned and paid for <laughs> in more ways than one, um, and reading that the first um, compilation, official canon, canon means standard in Greek, yeah. was issued in 367 
by St. Athanasius at Easter. And I thought, well, how can you have Sola Scripture? You're St. <laughs> Athanasius, right? And, the, and uh, uh, here is the man saying, or showing me, historically, that the church is the one, given its revelation, that defined what would be canonical. Because I'd read the extra canonical writings. And you read those extra canonical writings and say, boy, am I glad we don't have the Gospel of Thomas or something. And say, <laughs> or you know, Peter. These, or yeah, any, any of these of Peter, things you're thinking, right? oh, well, that's, that's nice. <laughs> um, but unimaginable. Uh, that To me then, you know, I say, well, why on earth would you think that the Bible was the source of the church? It, I mean, just historically, it's not true. Yeah. And, and that kind of harkened back to the experience of trying to use the, um, um, uh, the Bible for a, uh, what, an owner, a, a manual which anyone could pick up. So. Uh, hold that thought I'll do for it. just a second. Time flies when you're having fun. We're going to take a break, come back just a moment with your questions, and we're continuing this story. So stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. We've got a lot of phone calls and emails already waiting for us to, uh, to jump into, but I want to take a chance, maybe a couple minutes for you to, to, to tap up, cap up your journey. All right. In the end, what is it that actually brought you into the Catholic Church? Well, uh, we had been, uh, we finally decided that we should go to church. Maybe just, not just to keep up appearances as theology students. <laughs> uh, so we started attending a Methodist church because it was close and they had the music that we knew. And uh, uh, it was familiar, okay? So uh, we went there for about a year. My wife and I was married then, I'm married now. Uh, it's the same wife, it's <laughs> amazing, yeah. <laughs> you have to clarify that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I was, uh, I, I somehow got involved in teaching a young adults class uh, there, and um, one of the problems with it was we became a Methodist in 20 minutes. They explained, you know, I went in and sat down with a very nice preacher, and he said, this is what Methodists believe, and by gosh, we were Methodists, you know, in minutes. It was, it was uh, very convenient. Um, but, but we were dissatisfied, became increasingly dissatisfied, at the same time getting crunched from both ends of history and rediscovering uh, uh, various things in, in the church. I finally recognized they're Catholic. I'm becoming, more, both of us are becoming more and more dissatisfied with what was going on there. And we finally just sat down in semi-despair and said, I guess we'll have to convert. You know, it, it, so, so I did, instead of leaving into the church, we kind of backed into it, realizing that this is true. We, we can't avoid it. Yeah. Uh, now, that, that doesn't mean we didn't love our conversion. You know, we were very excited about it. But in an odd way, it was kind of like being cornered by the truth. And you <laughs> kind of realize that it's going to be asking things of you that you don't know whether you want to give. Hmm. One thing you could tell about Catholics, they were serious. Yeah. You know, what we, was being asked of you was really serious. This is like joining the Navy SEALs. These guys were out <laughs> to do something with you. Um, so we, we, we converted in, in 1987. Um, and so, so since then, you know, I'm very avidly learning what it means to be a Catholic in, in every sense of the word. So that's how I got in. They let me in somehow. You know, I love that way you stated that about becoming Catholic is like becoming a member of the Navy SEALs. <laughs> and, and there's a wonderful verse in 1 John that says, and now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. I mean, in essence, the whole goal of the Catholic Church is to help us grow in holiness so that we can stand without embarrassment before our Lord. Yes. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and it's not easy. No, no. That's the whole point of it. I, I, it it's, uh, it's a most serious demand for holiness. Uh, 
and, and sometimes I think, oh, well, you know, it wouldn't be an easier way, but you, know, you keep searching in scriptures and it just gets worse. I think you know, that, that it's very serious that you have to become perfect. It's a command. Yeah. It's a command, and, and it's a frightening command. Uh, but if you realize it's true, you, what, what choice do you have? That's wh where we yeah, ended up. That's it's true. We don't have a choice. And it's too bad we didn't have an hour because I know that in your the telling of your story, there's lots of little things that are probably important details that are sadly left <coughs> out. But maybe the questions will bring it up. So <coughs> talk about the scary details. You ready to take on a, an email oh, or something? All right. Just perfect. <coughs> Robert in Dayton, Ohio, Marcus and Dr. Weicker. How can Catholics help to educate a society that already accepts abortion, contraception, and euthanasia as routine about the dangers of cloning and other cell reengineering projects that will undoubtedly compromise our most basic <coughs> Christian doctrine that God is the sole author and creator of life. It seems that we are at a point where only God's powerful intervention can stop this culture of death. Please comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's simple. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what I was hoping I would get. No, th I, I actually can't answer this. Um, one of the things that makes you afraid is, is not reading church history. If you read church history, you find out that it's been bad the whole time, <laughs> right? The church started out in a culture that accepted all the things that that person yeah. has listed. Within their and, technology, I mean. Uh, <laughs> well, they were good at it though. Yeah. They had infanticide, they had abortion, they had contraception, they had homosexuality, they had whatever, you know, all of these uh, uh, things that this person is rightly worried about. They were there. Christianity faced it already. You know, it's not a question of, oh, what a new time. We're facing such, uh, well, the reason people haven't been facing them for a while is that those first Christians did face them. And it was through uh, a thousand year slow, grueling, uh, a re, uh, reawakening of, of true goodness and, and baptizing of Europe that um, the opposition to abortion and all these other things was made into uh, part of the culture hmm. and handed down the laws uh, which, which defined how people understood what you should be doing. So the reason, the only reason that, a, that there's ever been a, a, a law against abortion was because of Christianity and because of Christians who went into a pagan culture without fear and of course a lot of them were martyred. Hmm. So the other thing is don't expect a way around the cross. Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> but the good news, it's been done before. It's been done throughout the history of the church. And so really in the end we, it's, we can, we're not responsible to change <coughs> culture first so that we have an easy culture to live our Christian faith in. Hmm. We're called to live our Christian faith in the culture to which God has planted us mm -hmm. right now to live that, even if it calls us to martyrdom. Yeah. That's right. And I think another part of this question is recognizing reality that you had the privilege of reading all these Machiavelli and Hobbes and, and, and the group that kind of broke away from that early Christianization of our culture. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Broke it. That's a good way to put it. And, and you, 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 from your experience of reading, were able to then see that and then address people and said, don't, don't you know this? Well, you're, but the average person out there watching the show mm -hmm. is probably not going to sit down and read Machiavelli or Hobbes uh, by tomorrow afternoon, nor should we even encourage some of them to read that. <laughs> but what should they do? How can they become aware of what led to where we are so, they, so they're no longer blinded by the darkness? Now that's a difficult question. Um, part of it will be uh, simply through making how it, such a thing occurred clear mm -hmm. to people. Uh, now the, the, what the church is saying in various documents, like uh, Fides Eratio, well Fides Eratio is simply telling you what you need to know. You know there, there's, no, uh, there's no difficulty if you read that document and understanding what the Pope is saying is a problem. So he's addressing it straight he, on. He's addressing it straight. He, uh, he understands these things. Mm -hmm. uh, so Which you, I think he's been doing ever since Veritatis Splendor and yeah, other things, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. trying yeah. to get us to hear yeah. from different angles. And you, you have to say, and, and, and the, the, the distinction between a culture of death and a culture of life is this distinction, mm -hmm. you know, that, that I discovered not through reading papal encyclicals, yeah. but through reading 
uh, uh, the whole history of, yeah. of, of philosophy and political philosophy. Uh, so so it, it is already out there. Now, on the, on the other side, we need to have more out there yeah. because it's not out there now. Hmm. You know, there's, it's not enough. It needs to be trumpeted. It needs to be made clear. It needs to be argued for all kinds of people. You can't pick up, for example, a, a, a papal document and go whack somebody on the head who doesn't think anything of the authority of the Pope. Right. Now they might accept his, his arguments and say, those are good arguments. But in a way, you're called to evangelize the culture by all kinds of means. And so rather than saying there's a bunch of things out there now, well, there may be, but we need, to, we need more. Um, uh, do you, can you recommend any collection of church fathers to read, for example, that might awaken people to you know, take him back. What helped you? I mean, in, in that well, I, I, I mean, we have avid readers that watch the show. And well, what what actually for a book, for a book. helped me was reading. Um, now this sounds odd, but the the professor who most helped me was not a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a disciple of the twentieth century, two twentieth century uh, political philosophers, Leo Strauss and Eric Vogelin, and those two most clearly understood that disruption mm. caused by the rejection uh, of the goodness of nature. Right. So in regard to my own uh, uh, journey, that, that's where it came from, and it led me to Catholicism. Uh, but I see all too many people unaware of that, uh, that rupture that took place. Well, maybe another a book to recommend, I can't think of a specific one, but might be a, a a simplification of, of St. Thomas or something, where we're jumping into the stream at the time when the, the Christianization of culture is now flourishing this wonderful writer in St. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Certainly, uh, the, St. Thomas is good to read for any yeah. reason, <laughs> and certainly this, uh, but uh, in many ways it's, it's something that needs to be done yeah. because you're not talking, you, you have to address exactly the, the intellectual problems that are vexing us, and it's important. That's what St. Thomas did. Mm -hmm. uh, his day, right? In his day, he, he is hitting those most important questions. Let's, I'll tell you what, let's take our first caller, John from New York. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus, it's a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you, John. Um, I had two, I probably won't have time to get them in, uh, for Dr. Weicker. Uh, when I grew up, growing up, evolution, um, if I recall correctly, was not considered or accepted as far as human beings is concerned, by the Catholic Church, the literature I seem to read now as I'm teaching my 13-year-old uh, seems to have changed that. That's no question number one. And the other, if I can get it in quickly, is I spent a lot of time without the benefit of a PhD reading over the last 20 years, and uh, uh, this, there seems to be three explanations only for the possibility of our existence, and I, I'm trying to understand if you know why people like a brilliant Carl Sagan hmm. could, um, with the basic fundamental law of cause and effect, just ignore that theory and say there is no God uh, when something so fundamental is there that we know of in our material world. Uh, I hope I haven't confused you. <laughs> Thank you, John. With, uh, uh, with the man you met, Carl Sagan, I mean, his simple explanation of the word he always wanted to repeat over and over, billions and billions and billions, but the beauty is that when you make this time go so far back, it's easy to make time plus chance your God. Yeah, now that, that indeed was his goal. And uh, one thing, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book, I hope finishing up now, but I'm trying to make clear why it is just exactly this question the gentleman is asking, why would somebody uh, in the face of evidence want to uh, deny that there is an intelligent designer, that there is a God? Um, and uh, if you look at Sagan's own life, yeah. there really is a way in which we can search for what will vindicate, what will bring about the kind of universe we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember you know, reading Freud, who said in his Future of an Illusion uh, that Christianity was merely a projection. Uh, an easy way out of our of our petty desires onto eternity, 
And I, and I thought that was nuts because Christianity asks for so much. Yeah. It's scary. <laughs> it's not I mean, if a God exists, you're, you know, we're all in trouble, right? I mean, if somebody's in charge of this thing, uh, we're in trouble. Uh, so there, there's a real fear, which does determine the intellect. Hmm. And, and, and one of the signs of this is that Sagan was obsessed with finding intelligent life elsewhere, and he believed, and this is true, uh, uh, that, that in our own galaxy, uh, according to his calculations, there must be a million civilizations of, of intelligent uh, beings capable of sending us messages. Well, what it really meant, well, I mean, you didn't have any evidence for that at all. What it really meant was, I want to believe this because it denies the status of this weird creature, yeah. uh, the, the rational animal, the human being. So he, he wanted to believe something. We're not only an accident, we're an accident amongst thousands of accidents. Yeah, so, you know, if, if the cosmic soup can generate that many, uh, then, then uh, there's nothing for me to worry about. I can yeah. sleep at night. Yeah. I can sleep at night. And it's also important that once you take certain moral positions and your life becomes tied up with those moral positions, then you will want a universe to support it. Hmm. Because there's a kind of a, a, a yeah. symbiosis there, you know, uh, that, that, it, that if the universe is a certain way, I've got to act a certain way. Right? Hmm. If it really is and can be shown to be a beautifully ordered universe, when I mean, there must be a beautiful order, mm. then there's going to be a moral aspect that you can't ignore, or deny, or get around. Right. Yeah, in yeah. fact, we would encourage the audience if you want to uh, read a very clear description of this whole process, just read the first chapter of Romans. The, yes. I mean, it's, it's it's right there, and Paul explains exactly what has mm. happened, and the end result of that. And people who want to have a world that, that really expresses their own moral convictions, they'll recreate a world and deny yeah. a creator. And what about the first part of the gentleman's question about evolution? The, the, the impression that the church has changed its teaching on it. Yeah, I, um, what the, the Catholic Church does, which I think makes it both a more dangerous ride <laughs> than, than Protestantism and also an irritation to secularists, is that it takes all the arguments very seriously. So it's going to take evolution seriously. And I, th I think maybe there's a, a, a fundamentalist aspect that simply you don't even want to engage the arguments. Mm -hmm. But there's a wonderful passage in St. Thomas where he says that the, the, the uh, contrary to truth cannot be proved. The contrary to truth cannot be proved. And Christ is truth, right? So you're never going to be able to prove the opposite. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is you don't have to fear Science, but you've got to, you've got to keep tabs on them. Now, uh, in regard to evolution, you know, I, I kind of I'll just be quick about. You know, I never thought about it one way or the other until I tried to teach it, <laughs> and I read this stuff and I said, "This is awful argument. This has holes all the way through it." If, if somebody handed me this as, as an undergraduate paper, it could become, you know, I just red mark the thing. <laughs> you know, you can't make these arguments, and and others have come to that conclusion. Um, now, that, what that means is you still take the argument seriously, and that's harder to do than simply reject them. Mm. You know, I think that's what the Pope is asking us to do. Take them seriously, um, but realize you don't have anything to fear. Right. And I don't think we do. You know, the more that I studied it, and that's one of my areas of focus now, the more I thought, well, you know, that's, that's a, there's a hole in this argument. Mm. No, there's more than one hole. There's this problem, this problem, this problem. Um, and, and even we modern secular biologists are coming to the same conclusion. Are coming to the exact same. In fact, conclusion. some of them convert. Yeah. Some of them convert. They they uh, uh, they phrase, this can't be by chance. Yeah. It just can't be. You know, for the astronomer uh, Fred Hoyle uh, uh, is it, just one example. So uh, yes, you do have to be. I think that one part of the gentleman's uh, uh, question was, uh, I'm teaching my son this, and I'm having trouble with us. Well, you do have to be very careful with what you teach. Uh, Philip Johnson's book, um, Darwin and Trial, is probably the yes. easiest, most accessible, but thorough introduction. Yes. You know, a good place to start. Okay, great. That, that gets us into, into a big issue, but yeah. uh, we need to get as many questions as we can. I'll take this next email, Teresa from Rhode Island. Dear Marcus and Benjamin, please assist me in understanding why the concept that truth is relevant becomes a choice among intellectuals. Thank you for your time. Why would they buy into the idea that truth is relevant? In other words, how, how does, I'm assuming she means that, that why would truth, why would the quest for truth 
make you convert. Okay. Um, one thing um, that brought about my conversion was the focus on epistemology. Now, epistemology is a is a hundred and forty dollar word. It means how we know. <laughs> it's the study of knowing. How does a human being know, right? Well, the more I studied it, the more I, I uh, uh, and, and you know, the same kind of uh, uh, format as I had studied the other things, uh, I came to the conclusion th uh, what it really meant to be true mm -hmm. and how you had to understand and where the errors are um, in, in, you know, kind of radical skepticism or undue rationalism. Um, and the result was that... Um, the, 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 the passion for the truth will have to lead you to a source. Mm -hmm. It's just that simple. As long as you don't give up on the passion or you turn away from it because you don't like what it implies. Mm -hmm. But if you just teach the truth and you're very careful about it, uh, you, you will end up at the right place. Now, another thought in that question, I think, and we've got another email waiting for us, so we'll go this quickly, is you know, it, how can intellectuals accept the philosophical foundation that truth is relevant mm -hmm. when in fact the statement itself is self-contradicting? Or, or would you say from your experience of philosophy that in fact the general intellectual doesn't buy the idea completely? Oh, the truth, well, you could, truth is, 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 uh, is, relative. is relative, yeah. Relative, relative okay. Well, in, in um, that notion actually had its greatest source in the rejection of nature as the source of truth. Right? In other words, if I don't believe that uh, nature is ordered by a god, and so ordered intelligently, well, the source of order is going to have to come from myself. Right. Well, if the source comes from myself, then I'm the one that defines truth. And you're going to define so yours, and you're going to define yours. And, okay. and that is, there's no way there's out of that. There's only thing left if there's you nothing believe left, that no. chance and time formed everything. No, there isn't. No, All because what you're seeing isn't, isn't the source of truth. You're saying, you, what you're looking at is a, is a snapshot of, of, of sand shifting. And it's you not that it makes it. sense, it's yeah. just that that's all that's left. Yeah, that is all that's left. you begin with yeah. chance. And that, that is why modernity ends up in skepticism. Yeah. You know. okay. All right, let's take this next email. This is Howard in Florida. Dear Margaret and Dr. Weicker, over the centuries, people who have wanted to have an excuse to deny God have pointed to the evil in the world. With the philosophy of naturalism and materialism being ascended in our society, do you think that now the shoe is on the other foot and people must face the question of why there is goodness and altruism in the world? That's <laughs> I like that question. Well, uh, now, where does he teach at? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Wait a second. Um, one weird thing uh, that you that I find, you know, when uh, I'm working in the philosophy of science, and, and you read people um, uh, in the debate, they're saying things like. Well, one of the reasons I don't believe in God and a materialist is there's so much evil in the world. The response is, folks, think about this. If there's no God and nature is ordered by chance, there is no evil in the world and you can't have a complaint, right? So if you want there to be good and evil, which is fine, it's how you should start, there has to be a God. As soon as you give up God and you put everything in simple, random material causes, you can't have good and evil. Yeah. So your argument is self-refuting. Doesn't that touch on Pascal's wager? In, in a sense, it does. Uh, uh, Pascal thought you're always better off uh, in the long run. He was, he was actually using gambling theory. It's kind of hilarious. Uh, a great mathematician. Um, that you're, you're better off wagering your life on, on uh, the existence of, of uh, God because all he's asking for you to do is be good. Now, the problem is his theory gets kind of... Yeah. <laughs> misapplied. <laughs> so it really looks like you're flipping a coin, you know, with three right. sides. Right. But it, it, it's reality. I mean, look at all the options. Yeah. The one option that does make sense in the end is accept the reality of God. But the well, the first, yeah, that is the, that's the beginning point. You yeah. know, that you can't have an argument about good and evil with me unless you accept the reality of God. And then we can talk about the nature of God. That's where Christianity comes in. Yeah. Because it is, it's evil is serious. So, so in his sense, what he's saying is that, okay, given that, if everyone accepts chance and everything, then the fact that you would seek something we might call goodness would be the argument in the other example for the yeah. You've got to account. You've got. It's not just that the that the, the materialist ha materialist has to show you where evil came from or good came. You've got to show you both because mm -hmm. according to the modern uh, um, doctrine of materialism, neither is there. I mean, mm -hmm. Thomas Hobbes simply said there is no natural good and evil. 
Okay, but if there is good, and I think it's what this person is saying, right. how do you account for that? And doesn't that, in fact, we talked about this long thread that you had rediscovered in mm -hmm. your studies. Isn't the argument not only from design, but the argument for the reality of good as a sign of good and evil go way back to Thomas oh. and Anselm and others? So it's an old All the way back to argument. Plato. All the way back to Plato. All the way back to Plato. So <laughs> if we live in a culture that has truncated itself from all of that heritage. Yeah, yeah. Because it all began with the belief that nature itself was the beginning point and the human soul could even rise further above. Well, if you don't believe in a human soul, you can't rise very yeah. far, right? I'll tell you what, time flies. Last question, how has this whole journey brought you closer to the Lord Jesus? I want to make sure that we talk about it, because sometimes we get so focused yeah, on philosophy sure, in the church, no. but let's don't forget who it's all about. Yeah, no, that, that is uh, the essential question. Um, and, and it's happened in so many ways that I think, oh my gosh, what could I say? But I, but I will say this. First of all, uh, he's not just a good guy. Uh, this is, uh, you know, God is a person. Uh, and uh, one thing that's made me much more aware of being a Catholic is of the demands of Christ for perfection. When he says, uh, if you love me, you will do these things, it's, he's, he's really saying, you will follow me to the cross. You know, I, I just remember being overwhelmed uh, by, by the beauty of St. Thomas, who pointed to the crucifix and said, that is the truth. There's no way around it. You can't get around the crucifix. I remember in graduate school, somebody, uh, it was a wonderful evangelical buddy of mine, said, you know, Ben, <laughs> you, know, you know why we don't have Jesus on the cross? We have a bare cross? Because he's risen. And I didn't think of my comeback. You know, I'm almost too slow in that. I said, but later I thought of it. No, I knew something was wrong. I said, no. If you're Christian, you're not going to forget that he rose. The danger is forgetting the crucifixion yeah. because that is the heart of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's what the tendency to forget. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this unimaginable act of love, but you're called to it. That was one of the things that turned me away, I guess, from Protestantism. Mm -hmm. is that I didn't see the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And I knew that he was serious about that. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an example. I got crucified. You don't have to, he's saying. If you're going to follow me, you're really going to follow me. There's only one way through. Yes, sadly, we have an, uh, many Christian traditions today that want to uh, pose a Christianity without any suffering, yeah. without any sacrifice. It's all been done for us for Jesus. So now all we got to do is kick up our lazy boys and then relax to the end. Yeah. And that was never what he intended. No. We Catholics believe it was once and for all on the cross. We believe that but now we're called to live it out yeah. by His grace, yeah. day by day. Dr. Weicker, thank you thank so you. much for joining us. Boy, we have to have you back. Oh and my goodness. So many questions, not only in <laughs> emails, but things we didn't get to on paper, because I particularly think this issue of science and religion is so important, and, and those of you watching, you may have seen some of his bylines in a number of publications. Mm -hmm. You write a regular column for Nas National Catholic Register. Yes, is that right? Yep and other Catholic magazines, mm -hmm. and you've got a book coming out on the issues of science and religion? I certainly do, as <laughs> soon as I finish it and as soon as they publish it. Right. So I hope sometime next fall or maybe by Christmas. All right, well great, thank you very much. Thank you. And <clears throat> thank you for joining us, as always, on The Journey Home. Tonight's issue is a very important issue in our life, in our culture, in the lives of our children. So we need to pray that God will guide us, guide our theologians, guide our scientists, to keep their focus on Jesus Christ as together we're on the journey home, responsible for it. Thank you.